Good morning, church. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Where else would you want to be but right here? Because we have a God that's alive. So we're going to sing something called My Redeemer Lives. So please rise and join us and glorify his name. One, two, three. Shout a praise this morning, church. Amen. One, two, three, and something called my one way.
That'll get you up. Psalm 95, 6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker.
never so much that we can come into your house and tell your story with song we just ask the holy spirit to come into this place now can't wait to see what's going to happen today now we hand it over to pastor eddie in your name we pray amen all right come on let's give him a shout there isn't anything i think that's more awesome is that when god's people gather and we remember the reason why we're even in the room. Amen? 
because of him, by the grace of God. Oops, there you go. It's great to have technical assistance for the, for the, the handicap technology rise, right? All right, uh, where was I? Okay, as were the priests, teacher of the law, and Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, it's kind of like a gathering going on as we're having here. It says, this day is holy to your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and rejoice and enjoy. Choose choice food and sweet drink and send some to those who have not nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I, I, I want us to remember that the joy of the Lord in the midst of all the things that we're going through is our strength. That our God is for us and he's not against us. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's worthy of a shout. Woo! <laughs> So listen, do me a favor, share that joy with somebody else, turn around, greet someone, say hello, make a friend. guys are awesome. Such a, such a just a great group of friendly people by the grace of God. And um, I just want to welcome everyone and uh, so grateful that you decided to come and gather with us as we are going to reflect on the beauty of God's story. Uh, from deeds, from just loving kindness as you came in from a greeter, an usher, to sharing God's story through music, as well as we share God's story through His Word. It is a beautiful thing that you and I have an opportunity to engage in. And uh, the reason why, and I, I want all our first-time guests and returning guests to know that the reason is because we believe that New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that, amen, because He's awesome. We endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. And so I'm going to ask, as we're going to love all our, all our teens and all our children to come up front, because we love these guys. Do you like the Phillies? You know, Thatcher's beat Stone Crabs yesterday. Did they? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You it was like a oh, oh, there we go. Good. I know, you just like sitting there to talk on the mic. My little preacher boy. My little preacher boy. Well, listen, we love children here at New Hope. And uh, I, I, 
If there's anything that I believe reflects the, the, the love and the grace of God is when we come and we go and reach out to the little ones. And the little ones might not just be children. They not, might not be teens. They might be little one adults who are not, uh, maybe they feel left out. Maybe they're struggling. Maybe, you know, they don't feel connected. And uh, Jesus went out of his way to tell the disciples, don't hinder the little ones from coming. And so we shouldn't hinder the little ones. We shouldn't hinder our teens. We should not hinder one another from gathering. So we, we bring them up forward to symbolize that truth, that Jesus brought them up to bless them, to pray for them, after he had rebuked all of his disciples because they were hindering them. So we don't want to be like that. We want to learn that lesson. And so symbolically, if you wouldn't mind extending your hands to the front, we're just going to pray a blessing like Jesus would have prayed a blessing over our teens and over our children. Father, thank you, Lord, for our children. Thank you, what a gift they are. Thank you, Father, that, uh, Lord, that you have, Father, graciously provided and given these children to us as a gift, as your word says. And so, Father, may we be good stewards. Father, may we teach them the story of God. May they learn His character and His beauty. Thank you for all our gospel-transformed leaders and servants in, in our youth ministry and our children's ministry that prepared lessons, Lord, all week long to invest in the story of God in our children. We give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Awesome, awesome. Woo, all right. School has started. Families are home. Praise the Lord. Well, listen, do me a favor. Pull out this weekend program. If, if you do not have a weekend program, please raise your hand. There's just a lot, a lot of stuff going on. We'd love to get one in your hand. One of our ushers would grab it. And uh, we out of bulletins. Sorry. So if, if one of our guests doesn't have a bullet, raise your hand and we'll easily swap one. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Just a few real quick things. One, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, there's this white sheet in your program uh, that uh, talks about, is it white? No. Yellow. <laughs> Ivory. Ah, uh, whatever. It looks tan to me. But what? This is our, our uh, New Hope Bible School of Equipping, and uh, I can't encourage you enough. Uh, to sign up, there's an opportunity to sign up for one of the classes. I, we kind of redid it to put the names of the uh, instructors on the classes that they're leading. And so uh, there's limited seating, so we're basically doing it by first come, first serve. Uh, it'll be on a Wednesday night and uh, here at, uh, at New Hope, uh, probably in the modulars at uh, 7 o'clock. And uh, I can't encourage you enough, fill that out and then just put it in that, uh, any one of those offering boxes as you see there. Uh, the other thing I want to say, listen, is that um, uh, if you ever have a heart to serve, like in First Impressions Ministry, that would include, there's five teams, and when we say First Impression Ministries, greeters, ushers, uh, guest services, which is the, the, the table that sits out here so that people can have a place of connection and, and get more information, uh, our parking team, and our hospitality that provides all the hospitality. Um, having a barbecue, Norma and I having a barbecue, Norma runs uh, First Impressions, and we were having a barbecue, it's time to kind of fellowship, meet and greet, and a little envisioning as uh, we're looking and realize that uh, we, have, we have more than enough people to, 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 to maintain all, all the ministries that we have, but we know that this, if we want to take it to the next level, we need you. And so we don't need you, we want you. And so if you have a heart for that and want to learn more, please, there's, I don't know if there's information in the bulletin. There is no information, but the, my address should be there somewhere. Talk to Norma in the back. We'd love for you to stop by. It's at 1 o'clock today. Uh, last thing I'm going to mention is uh, quickly in your weekend program, there is our mid-year report. And uh, I, I, I like uh, uh, things to be very open. And so every, in the mid-year, we provide all our financials, basically where we stand. By the grace of God, thank you for your generosity because of your generosity uh, just take a moment, look through the weekend program, and the lives that are being touched are amazing. I mean, up from January to now, we've, we've had about 30 people who have given their lives to Jesus and gotten baptized just within the first six months. I mean, it's just been an amazing thing. And so there's just great information here. We'd love for you to know. 
and here and um, uh, take a moment. If you're saying, Eddie, how do I get involved? How do I use my gifts? This pink, it says connection card. Uh, just name, email, that would be great. There's opportunities there to serve. If you have a heart, um, a lot of that first impression, just you can come to, uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, if you want to bring a dish, bring a dish. That'd be awesome. It's not required, but we'd, uh, uh, you could feel free to do that if you'd like to. And uh, prayer requests in the back. Uh, we love to pray. And God's called us to be a house of prayer. Amen? Amen. And so we want to continue to pray for you. Take a moment, fill that out. And once again, when you have an opportunity, just put that in the, any one of those offering boxes, and uh, they'll come to us and we'll pray. Amen? All right. I'm Max. And I'm the luckiest dog in New York because of her. Come on, Max. I gotta go. See you tonight. Bye, Gidget. So long, Mel. See you later, Chloe. Guys. Any plans today? I got big plans. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for Katie to come back. Oh, I miss her so much. She's back! She's back. Hey, Maximilian! I have some big news. Oh. Max, this is Duke. <gasps> He's going to be your brother. <laughs> Chloe! Chloe! I got a bad situation. Katie brought home a psychopath from the pound. I don't even have a bed now. Ah! I'm sleeping on the floor like a dog. Duke is just ruining our lives. He's ruining. It's an emergency. Aw, oh, you did a cutie pie. Hey, Max. I'm headed outside. Max. Hide your own business. Oh my gosh, what happened to you? We had a great thing going. Huh. I blame myself. Yeah, me too. I blame you a lot. We'll bust the both of you out of here, but from now on, you work for me. Advantage me! <laughs> Uh-oh. Just ignore what just happened, okay? Run, <laughs> man! This is my city. I'll find you a friend. We gotta take the secret route. The secret route was death. Come on! We can find our way home. We are descended from the mighty wolf. Chuck, 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 Chuck. We have raw primal instincts. Hi, how are you? That are moments away from leading us home. Ah! Is it home that way? Seriously? The secret life of pets. I love movies. Don't you love movies? I think our whole culture is absolutely captivated by movies. And uh, it's the reason why uh, they make hundreds of millions of dollars. Because they hit on cultural issues that really kind of grab our attention, whether they're cartoons, whether they're live acting. And they begin, and what we've, all the research tells us is they shape culture. Uh, they shape the thinking and the values of our generation, our younger generation. And we need to be able to speak into that by the grace of God, amen? But before we go any further, let's bow our heads and begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we gather here today, we want to honor you, we want to exalt you, we want to hear your voice, Lord. In the midst of all the noise of culture and all the noise of movies and magazines and TV and DVDs and, Father, everything is screaming at us, Lord, we want to take a moment and hear your still voice, that it would set us free, that it would provide a breakthrough, that it would, Father, set us loose in such a way, Lord, that we would experience you in profound and deep ways. But, Father, there are just too many of us, Lord, just in this room, Lord, that are ceaselessly, Father, pursuing happiness, Lord, and it is 
Lord, no matter what we do, no matter what we achieve, no matter how much we give to it, Lord, it never, ever feels like it works out. And so today, Lord, we need a revelation from you. And so we, we open up our hearts and our minds to hear you and that you would have your way in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, if you haven't seen the movie The Secret Lives of Pets, in the movie, Max is a spoiled terrier who is enjoying a happy life in a New York City building until, and I want you to get that, until his owner adopts another dog named Duke. Now, in contrast, the Bible clearly teaches you and me how Christian joy is deeper, lasts longer, more satisfying than happiness could ever provide you and me. And at the same time, it is not based on circumstances. Why? Because Christian believers enjoy and rejoice in God who is not subject to any kind of circumstance. And for this reason is why we are continuing our summer teaching series called God on Film, where the scripture provides the text and the movie provides a context as we compare and contrast with the story of God in the Bible. Because the Bible clearly instructs us how life is a preparation for eternity. So as we examine today's scriptures, let's explore a life of encounter because joy is about who, not what. Let me say that again. Joy, biblical joy, is about who, not what. And I am absolutely convinced that this is best understood when you and I consider how everything in this life that makes you and me happy is merely a signpost. So don't mistake the signpost for what it is ultimate purpose is, is to point us to the one and only thing, which is, it is pointing us to an encounter with the city of God and with God himself. His kingdom and the God and the creator of all things. All the things that you and I, just take a moment and think about that for a second, that all the things that you and I enjoy in this life, God gave them to you and me as a gift. He didn't need them. He provided them to you and me, and they're all a shadow. They're all an hors d'oeuvre, just a mere tasting of the ultimate glorified beauty of his kingdom and his person and his presence. But sometimes we get so enamored with the shadow, with the little hors d'oeuvre, that we end up giving our life to that, and basically our lives are ruined. And, we want, and we're bitter, and we're angry, and we're full of all kinds of disappointment. And so today, by the grace of God, I, I, I am convinced that what this does, that it reveals to you and to me how God is most glorified in us when you and I are most satisfied in Him. As Dr. John Piper explains it. Now, this is what I think is so important. We need, this is why we need to choose joy or else we will just be merely existing or coping in life. And I'm just going to emphasize the fact that you and I were not created and not loved upon and pursued and relentlessly lavished upon to merely cope and to merely exist. And so as we examine today's scriptures, we're going to unpack three, what I'm going to call biblical examples or biblical reasons why you and I need to choose joy so that we would live life with God, okay, with God. It's a huge distinction. Because if we don't, 
What ends up happening is then you and I will choose substitutes or counterfeits in this life to compensate. And that's why many of us are self-medicating and trying to find our joy or happiness in something other than what you and I were created to experience the fullness, how the Bible explains it, the abundance that God has poured out in this life for you and for me. And there is a beauty about it that I believe. And so here are the options, okay? Here are the options of a biblical example, biblical reasons why we need to choose joy first, okay? So first we need to choose joy or a broken heart. There's really no gray area in between. We will choose joy or we will experience broken heart. Second, we need to choose joy or broken dreams. And third, we need to choose joy or broken relationships. And because we've accepted a substitute, because we've accepted counterfeits in this life, we've, all we've experienced our entire life has been broken hearts, broken relationships, and broken dreams. And then we're wondering, is that all there is? And the Lord's like, well, no, there is so much more. Why are you choosing the other? So if you don't, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Uh, you can use your electronic device, or your cell phone, tablet, whatever. If, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like a Bible, just raise your hand. We have plenty of Bibles. We'd love to give you a Bible. They're yours to keep. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll be reading verse 1. And it says, therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Woo, okay. So much in this text. Three little hors d'oeuvres I'm going to give you. There's so much more. I'm just going to give you three uh, that I believe are, are, are just hopefully whet your appetite so that you can spend the rest of the week kind of soaping on this passage of Scripture, observing and, and allowing God to speak to you because I believe He has a word there for all of us. And um, it's just an amazing thing. Let me, just, let me just start off by prefacing that. Did you, did you catch verse 1? It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I, I, I want you to understand that, there, that, that the heavenly host are rooting for you to choose joy, for you to be able to experience the fullness and the abundance that God has promised and prepared and gave you and me the opportunity to receive. That, that there are those who have already preceded us, who are now experiencing that, who are just waiting for you to come to a place of faith and go, yeah, and they're screaming. And so not only do you have this heavenly host, this, this cloud of witnesses, these believers who are rooting for you, your heavenly father who aches for his children is desperately crying out, choose joy. Choose the one who can satisfy your most deepest need, the one who can take you from utter despair and brokenness to great hope and perseverance that only He can give you. The one who can take you, who has experienced the most horrendous hurricane, whirlwind, painful experience in life, and then by His great power is able to then shift you into the eye of the storm for His glory and for your joy. And that, my friends, is where we're going to see God move in power and in signs and wonders and miracles because he desires to do so. Let's look at the first verse there. It says there, for a great cloud of witnesses, let us now, because of all that, throw off everything that hinders 
and the sin that so easily entangles us. See, the thing is, is that we're going to make a choice. And let me just start off and say that if you don't make a choice for joy, you've made a choice for something else. Not making a choice is a choice. And we, we, we need to really kind of grab a hold of that. The burden of responsibility is laid on us. We're either going to make the choice or we're not going to make the choice. And my encouragement today is that you would choose joy. Or else, we're going to be making choices that we just get us by. We, we're, we're existing, we're coping, and, and, and we're, we're living on the margins on the side, but never really entering in. And that's why I believe is that when we do that, that's why our hearts are broken. Our, heart, our hearts are broken because for some strange reason we've chosen this counterfeit, we've chosen a substitute, and we haven't come to the realization that we need to choose joy because happiness will never be enough. Happiness is based on a circumstance. Happiness is based on ABC happens, then I'll be happy. If these three things occur, then this will give me self-worth and value and all these other things. And what ends up happening is that it always, always, at the end, leaves us with a broken heart. It always leaves in a place of questioning. It always leaves, oh, you know, I don't understand. I don't understand about my life. I don't understand about my marriage. I don't understand about my children. I don't, I don't understand about my circumstances and all these other things. And, and, and it's just one broken heart. And, and we've gotten so accustomed to that that we, we're so used to having one broken heart, our heart broken and broken and broken and broken, we don't think that there's anything else. And we constantly have this cycle of broken lifestyle. And I'm here to tell you that there's another way. We need to have a solid conviction about God. That is the, probably the door that opens up so that you and I would choose a life with God. What ends up happening is we choose, a, we choose either a counterfeit or, or a substitute, and we then choose life over God. And there, there are some of us who have been in that place, some of us who have family in that place, or coworkers or neighbors, someone that we know, and sometimes we kind of go back and forth, you know, jumping back and forth. And what I mean by life over God is that ultimately, you know what? We've come to a place in our lives and said, you know what? My heart's been broken so much, you know, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I know what's good for me. I know what's the best for me. I'm going to make my own. I'm the master of my own destiny because I need my life in control. And so we're going to control everything. And the problem is uh, the more we try to control, the, the more we come to the realization we have no power to control anything. I can't control my spouse, I can't control my children, I can't control my neighbor, I can't control my parents, I can't control anybody. It's like, oh my God, you know what I mean? And the more and more I try for control, the more it slips out of my hands, and the more my heart is broken. And I grieve. And so we're choosing life over God. And we need to realize that this is, this is part of the first one that came right out of the guy in, in, in Genesis. See, Adam and Eve were created to experience, and they had life with God in the Garden of Eden, but that was severed. Why? Because they were going to choose to take control, and they were going to eat the apple, and they were going to say, no, 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 no. And as the, as the devil came and lied to them, oh, now you'll be like God. Like somehow the, the life that God had prepared and the enjoyment that they had in the whole world and the universe he created for them was not enough. That God himself and his presence in their midst was not enough. Somehow that God was kind of robbing them. And that's what ends up happening. We, we, we live life over God, thinking that God's hindering me. I don't want to come to faith. I can't tell you how many times I said that in the early days. How many times, oh, my friend, I can't become a Christian. I have to give up A, B, C, D, and this, and the other thing. Thinking like, 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 like those things were like the betterment. I'm choosing a counterfeit to try to find happiness, thinking if, if I had enough money, if I had enough Drugs, if I, if, 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 if I could run around and do whatever I wanted in my sexuality, that, oh, that's really what I have. It. That's really what it means to make it. And I wake up every day more broken and more desperate every day. And God's like, I got something way better for you. You see, not only do we try to live God, live over God, we try to live under God. 
What I mean by that is that there are many, some of, especially for those of us who've come to faith, it, it, he says it in, in Galatians, he says, what happened to you? You guys started out with grace, and now you went to this moral code. You, you, you know, we became Pharisees and Sadducees. All of a sudden now, they, we're not loving and kind and merciful and generous, and, and, and all of a sudden now we're, we're hard and we're judgmental and we're sitting on our righteous high horse and we feel superior over people. And Paul's like, what happened? What stole your joy? How could you start with the love and the grace and the mercy of God and then think that if you circumcise yourself, if you, if you, if you study hard enough, if you read the Bible enough, if you pray hard enough, if, if you beat yourself hard enough, then God will love you more. Do you think your heavenly father could love you any more than he already does? Ask any parent. How could you possibly love your child any more than you already do? Well, if they clean the house, if they fix the car, if they mow the lawn, then I would love them more. doesn't make any sense. But that's living on. So if I, if I do these 15 things, see, this, this is the thing about moralism, is that if I go through these steps, if I go through these rituals and traditions and, and all these other things, then basically God owes me at the end. It really goes back to control. Because if I'm just basically on God's mercy, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh. I mean, like, I don't have, like, he did it for me on the cross. I mean, Jesus lived the perfect life that I was supposed to live. Jesus not only lived the perfect life and obeyed all the laws, and he who knew no sin became sin, he actually paid my debt on the cross for all of my imperfections, for all my flaws, for all my rebellion, for all my disobedience and sin. He paid for that on the cross because his body was beaten and his blood was shed for me. He, he did that for me. And I didn't add to that. It's not Jesus plus my good works. It's not Jesus by how much me scripture memorization. It's not Jesus by how many hours I pray. It's not Jesus by how many services I go. It's not Jesus plus. It's like Jesus only. Is that, is that oh, wait a minute. Wow, I mean, that, that sets my heart free and such. I don't know what to do with that. So I choose a substitute. I choose a counterfeit. And I live under, I said, no, 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 I want to do these 15 rituals and ceremony and tradition so then God owes me. I like God owing me. See, that, I believe, is where many, and what we don't realize is that since from Genesis to Revelation, God has been relentlessly pursuing you and me and all of humanity, all, every man, woman, and child to restore you and me back to living life with God. Not over him, not under him. With him. You see, what you and I need to understand is that how, I mean, when, you, when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus lived, he was born, he lived, he died, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, all in proof, that's what we call the gospel, right? The story of God. Simply, to restore you and me back to being with him. See, the great joy was to say, wow, I mean, I mean think, about, think about if any one of us had a family member, you know, a, a child, a spouse that, that, that we, we, we have been so separated with and there's bitterness. I mean, what would we do to try to restore that relationship? And that's what our Heavenly Father, out of His great love for you, did. Look at um, verse 2. It says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the factor of our faith, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. See, this is where our joy comes. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. There's the who. That is where you and I, where we're going to experience an encounter with God. That is what everything God provided in the universe as a signpost pointing us to the one who is going to fulfill us and satisfy us 
so that all the gifts and talents he's given us, our brains, our hands, the resources he's given us, our time, talents, and treasure, everything that you and I enjoy, the sun, the moon, the stars, the beaches, the forests, the, 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 the Grand Canyon, the, the, the stars, okay? The, what, there's something going to happen on Monday. What's that? The, the eclipse, okay? The, the eclipse, everybody's like, wow, beautiful, yeah. All of that. All that joy is pointing, it's a sign point, pointing us to the ultimate encounter that's going to satisfy your soul. It's going to produce true, everlasting, deep, meaningful joy. And that's what they're there for. We are not to build our lives on these substitutes. We are not to try to substitute something that will always leave us with a broken heart and it also leaves us with broken dreams. See, because the joy set before him, and the dream was that you and I would be now with God. Not temporarily, not 50%, for eternity. And ultimately, that the dreams and the hopes that you and I are substituting or choosing a counterfeit, if I, if I get that job, if I get that career, if I get that education, if, if I have so much money in the bank, if, if this person truly loves me and cares for me, if, 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 my, if my children will finally just do what I tell them to do, or whatever it is, whatever the, 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 the thing is, that that's good, that basically now I feel like a somebody. The problem is that we're going to experience one broken dream after another, after another, after another. And what ends up happening is that because our dreams are broken all the time, we keep on choosing lesser and lesser dreams until we're slithering into the cesspool because we, we're, our hearts are so broken. Our dreams have been so shattered. I, I can't even think past the cesspool that I live in, the values, the convictions, the belief systems that I have. Because I'm so broken. You can't even believe that you were created and destined and purposed for something glorious. You can't believe that the life that God has for you and prepared. And this is the joy. See, Jesus was able to have a vision of the, of the city of God, the kingdom of God. He had a vision for his Abba Father. Philippians said that even though he was equal to God, Philippians 2, even though he was equal to God, he submitted himself to him. He submitted himself. He chose God's hope and God's dream and God's agenda, and Jesus laid down his hope, his dream, his agenda, knowing and leaving that example for you and me, and leaving the reason why we need to choose him to satisfy our most deepest joy in this life. The struggle is, is that See, this is the key. This is the key to, to joy. We need to choose joy, and we need to trust God for the outcome. Ultimately, what we see in Jesus, that's why you and I need to fix our eyes on Jesus. This is why there's a, there is this cloud of witnesses with your heavenly Father, okay, who's pouring out love. They say, okay, you got you got to pick this because... In the midst of our circumstance, this is where we all are. I know that there are so many of us in this room right now going through some terrible circumstances. Your heart is broken over a circumstance or something. The dream that you had for your life is not working out the way that it should be. And that ultimately, you're, you're, you're just so broken. You just, I can't even see anything good coming out of my life. I can't see anything possible of this ever working out for a positive. I just can't imagine that. And this is where I would tell you why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, because our God is a God of miracles. Our God can do the impossible. Our God is able. Our God is able to take a gruesome death, a m ultimate humiliation and violation, and turn that around to a great victory. And the God who's able to do that is the same God in your circumstance. And choosing joy is trusting God for the outcome. But our struggle, because we go after that counterfeit, is that we have a tendency to try to, we choose life from God. And that's the substitute. In other words, well, 
I can't really trust God for the outcome. And, and though we don't really say that in the forefront of our brains, it's the, the fact is that our life is producing what we really believe. Yeah. We got to grab a hold. We got to be able to have an honest journey with our own lives and be able to say that, you know what? The reason, the reason why, okay, you know what? I, I know I'm struggling this, that, and the other thing, but I'm, I'm coming to God. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to do all these things because I want a blessing. Okay? God, God okay? I did ABC for you. I scratch your back, now you scratch mine. All right? That's life from God, okay? It's this back and forth thing, okay, Lord? All right, you know what I mean? I'm going to sow a seat, and you're going to get me my Bentley, okay? You're going to get me that house. You're going to get me my healing. You're going to get me whatever. And we do this bargaining thing with God where I, if, I, if I do these 15 things, you're going to give me what I want because now you owe me. It goes back to control. And so we're living life from God. I'll do these five things and you bless me. You prosper me. That is not the intention of our God's going to give you those things or not give you those things according to his riches and glory out of his great love for you because of the great value, the infinite worth that you have to him. You don't have to... The scripture says that even, even, even a heathen would not give his son a stone or give him a serpent if he asked for bread. So why would your heavenly father, who takes care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, and they're more gloriously displayed, would not provide for you? You see? Choosing joy is trusting God for the outcome. And that is where you and I are going to be able, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the broken hearts, in the midst of the broken dreams, we're going to say, well, you know what? Because I realize that this life isn't everything. That my life is a preparation for eternity. Every man, woman, and child. And let me just, let me just give you one little piece here that, that captured my heart many, many years ago. See... I used to be, and I know what ends up happening, I don't really think about it in the forefront, but I always had in the back of my mind years ago that God was going to compensate me for all the pain and suffering I went through. Like my bank account, with all the pain, all the suffering, all the rejection, all the hurt, all the loss I experienced, all the whatever, ooh, God's going to, ooh, he's going to hook me up. When I get to heaven, he's going to compensate me. Eventually, when my brain kicked in, I realize a certain thing, that there are certain losses, certain disappointments in this life that you and I could never, ever be compensated for. A loss of a spouse, a loss of a child, a brutal violation to your person. What could God, what in the universe could God give me that could compensate for that. See, and you'll never read that in the Bible. God is not in the business of compensating. He's in the business of restoring all things. God's in the restoration. That ultimately we never ever have to say goodbye. It's always see you later. And that there is a great hope and a great beauty that one day God's going to weave all things for good, even though it's, right now it's impossible, even though I can't see it, even though it doesn't make any sense. My God is able. And that is where my joy is at, knowing that even though I can't taste it, smell it, see it, I know my God knows. And he's not compensating me. I don't want that. That's a counterfeit. That's a substitute. What you want is God's best. And we can't choose to live life from God because we know that pain is inevitable, but misery is not. See, this is why compensation doesn't work. In other words, you and I, I mean, if we live long enough, 
this is just the reality. The rea- you don't have to have any faith, you don't have to believe in anything. If you and I live long enough on the earth, every single person that you and I have ever loved in this life will be gone. That's, it's just time. You and I have no power over time. And so that's going to be painful, no doubt. I, I wish, when, when my mother passed away uh, a few years ago, my grandmother, who's still alive, her mom, she's 96 years old, and, and my heart was aching, but when my grandmother came, she wailed. And I'm thinking, and it caught, me by, it caught me off guard for a second. I realized it doesn't matter. That's her baby. And I realized, and I realized that ultimately my grandmother has a great hope. I mean, if it wasn't for my grandmother, my sister would have never came to faith. I would have never came to faith. My, my aunts and uncles would have never came to faith. She was the patriarch of faith in our heathen family. I <laughs> didn't believe in God, and we were running all over the place. But I know she has a great hope that even though in the grief she realizes, that's what keeps her going, knowing that, hey, it's not over. It is not over. The gospel joy is just a foretaste of the future glory that he has a stain for you and me. See, that's where the joy comes from, the future glory that lays before us. It's not what's behind us. It's not parking ourselves in the pain. That's misery. We're choosing misery, or we could choose the future glory that he has. Jump down with me to uh, verse 3 there. And it says, Consider him who, I hope you see that, every verse, who, fix your eyes on Jesus. I mean, over and over. Choosing joy is a who, not a what. Who endure such opposition from sinners so that you and I will not grow weary and lose heart. My friends, I understand. Many of us have had our hearts broken and shattered. Our dreams are just scattered along the ground. Our relationships have been so broken and devastated. And this is why we desperately, as God's people, have to choose joy. Because it is in him and his promise to you that even Jesus, who his life was cut short, who he was abandoned by all his disciples and everyone who loved him, he was rejected and beaten on the cross. It says most profoundly for the joy set before him. Because he saw future glory, he was able to see something beautiful And he realized that whatever he was going through now was a temporary thing in comparison to the great eternal joy that he would experience when you and I are now living with him. Not to live over, under him, above him, not live from him, but actually live with him. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, that has been God's word to you and to me. You and I, This is why the Bible says that the angels look at this thing and they go, oh my God. Wow, they have no idea what they got. The angels look amazed, the Bible says to us, at this great salvation because God has purposed all these things. He put all these signposts in our lives to point us, to fix our eyes on Jesus so that you and I would know that one day that encounter is going to restore all things. The Bible says in Revelation that he's going to wipe away every tear, every hurt, every pain, every sorrow, everything. I I wish I could tell exactly how that's going to work. I don't know. But that's his promise. In the Old Testament, he says in Joel chapter 2 that God's going to restore all of what the locusts have eaten in your life. I mean, from Old Testament to New Testament, God has had this one plan. And that one plan is that you and I would be with him. And that when we're with him, God makes all things new, and his mercy and his grace are new. And all the broken relationships are being restored. And so we need to choose God and choose joy, and we need to yield surrender to his control. And the reason and how we do that is ultimately we, ha- we need to praise him. 
We need to praise him in the storm. We need to shout for joy in the midst of all the things that you and I are going through because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And the reality is that we all belong to him. And God's love is steadfast and his purposes are good. And I might not understand all the tragedies that we go through, but I I know that my God is good and my God is for me, not against me. And that gives me great hope for another day. That's the reason why we come to communion. I mean, it just really grabs my heart in profound ways. Because what communion does is that it reminds us. This is why he says, do this in remembrance of him. This has nothing to do with whatever Christian tradition we come from. It's not a ritual or a ceremony, okay? This is God's ultimate signpost to you and to me of future glory. It is God's way of reminding you so we can remember that Jesus, he gave up all of his joy. He laid it all down so that you and I would have eternal joy. Jesus became poor so that we would be rich in God with him. Jesus chose to be cast out so that you and I could be brought in. So this is why you and I need to choose. We choose joy. We choose Jesus so that we would be in living communion with him. And this is the signpost of his promises, that every promise he's ever made in his word is true and amen. That everything that he's ever explained or revealed to you is not something that if, but it's something that's when. It is an absolute surety and a certainty. And that is where my help comes from. That is where my joy comes from. That is where my assurance comes from. Let's all stand. But I want to suggest and ask us is that you would understand that when we come forward that we're saying, okay, Lord, my satisfaction is going to be in you. Not in a place, not in a thing, not in circumstance, because no matter how much I might pull out a little happiness out of those things, those things will never sustain us with eternal joy. They were never meant to. And so we come and we are remembering the joy set before us. And we're remembering that. And so if today you want to say, okay, Lord, I want to come and I want you. I want to choose you. I want to trust you because happiness isn't enough. Happiness will never sustain me. I, I want to I yield and surrender and lay down my hopes and my dream, my agenda, and pick up your perfect dream, your holy dream, your future glory that you set before me. And that is what we do when we remember him. And that's what we realize is greater joy than anything else. And so if, you, you, if we, you've made that commitment, I would encourage you to come as a reminder to recommit choosing and fixing your eyes on Jesus who is the joy of the Lord which is your strength in all your circumstances. And some of you might be like, well, Eddie, I'm not sure if I'm ready yet. You know, I'm, I'm so, listen, thank you for coming. We love you. Please come back. We want you to hear some more. We're going to love you regardless. Whether you believe what we believe or don't believe, it doesn't matter. God's called us to love you regardless. But don't come up and take communion if, if, if you're really not making that choice today. Because it would just be a dead, meaningless ritual. God wants you to choose to be with him. Not over, not under, not from. Amen? Now, the song is being played. Feel free to come forward. Hold on to the communion elements. And then uh, I'll close in prayer.
recognize that only you could give us joy deep in our soul that is meaningful and long lasting and father profound that it brings life transformation and so Lord we come before your throne of grace Lord knowing Lord that Lord there isn't anything that we can do or say or achieve that would make you love us more Accept us more. You have already proven that on the cross when you sent your son to purchase our freedom and redemption and salvation. And so with a cheerful heart, Lord, trusting you for the outcome, surrendering control to you, for you to be the light onto our feet, for you, Father, to be our shield and our right guard, for you, the one to provide our Jehovah Jireh, providing for all that we need according to your riches and glory. And so we take your body and your blood together in remembrance. And we give you all the joy and all the glory. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome week. Amen.